Welcome to the What Really Happened radio show. Putting America first, second, and third. Here is your host, Michael Rivero. And aloha, America. Welcome to our show. It's Thursday, May 29th, 2014. Sure happy it's Thursday. Sure happy it's Thursday. Sure happy it's Thursday. We have a lot of stuff to talk about today. The phone lines are open. 800-313-9443. 800-313-9443. James Fetzer will be our guest today in the third hour, talking about Jim Norvell's book about Lee Harvey Oswald. On Monday, June 2nd, David Maryland is going to be talking about some little-known details that he's uncovered in the U.S. tax code. And, of course, next month we're also looking at Dr. Gilbert Levin and Normal, Norman Finkelstein about coming on the air as well. So we got all kinds of guests coming onto the show here right now. Now, uh, remember mm, toward the 1st of May when the news was trumpeting that the uh, gross domestic product of the United States of America had increased by one-tenth of one percent. Huzzah, 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 proclaim the joyous glad tidings throughout the land because it means we're not in a recession. Because a recession is defined as three consecutive quarters of negative GDP. And they were out there saying, see, the economy's getting better, the economy's getting better, huzzah, huzzah, huzzah. Well, it turns out they were fibbing because the government just issued their revised figures for the first quarter of 2014, and the economy shrank by 1% at an annualized rate. So it was the third consecutive quarter of negative GDP, and that means, yes, we are, in fact, in a recession. But you're not supposed to think about that. We're going to pay attention to other things here today. Now, government analysts are blaming the slump on a major decline in inventory investment, especially among car dealerships, meaning that various retail operations are not buying new inventory because they're looking at the retail Mageddon across the country and realizing the American people don't have any more money to buy the stuff. And there was also a decline in U.S. exports. Uh, there was uh, uh, apparently this uh, uh, investment in inventory has dropped 12%. That's major league. And U.S. exports declined 10% in a single quarter. Most of that was in agricultural exports as foreign nations continue to reject and refuse U.S. GMO products. But they're going to take the focus off GMO and investment and mismanagement of the economy by a government totally in the pocket of Wall Street. They found a scapegoat here. This is over at New York Post. It was all the fault of the harsh winter. We were battered by a harsh winter, which is certainly true. But have you noticed that when they want to take a carbon tax, we're suffering from human-caused global warming, and when they're looking for something to blame for why the economy contracted in the first quarter, oh, it's the harsh winter. It's flipping back and forth. And uh, the article ends by saying, you know, uh, Economists are confident this is only temporary and it'll be coming back. Well, we've had these economists confident that the economy was going to improve since 2008, and it hasn't happened for the 99%. The 1% are doing great. They're making out like bandits, quite literally in many cases. Harry Truman used to say that if you took all the economists in the country and laid them end to end, they'd still point in different directions, and that's certainly true. Because all of these economists are being paid granted tenure, getting published, to not talk about the primary reason for economic hardship, which is that private central bank issuing all of the public currency as a loan at interest. It all goes back to that. And all these economists are getting their degrees and gold things on the wall and media attention and everything by, by trying to say, oh, no, there's something else going on over here. Pay no attention to that private central banker behind the curtain. It's the Wicked Witch of the West that we have to all worry about. Now, over in Libya, things are really unwinding over there. General Haftar has resumed airstrikes against the city of Benghazi. And so it is turning into an outright civil war. Here's another nation that the U.S. went in and did a regime change for the purposes of the bankers, and the nation has just absolutely descended into into chaos here. Now, we're not seeing a lot of coverage on the U.S. corporate media about Libya right now. Uh, 
Because after all, President Obama and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton declared Libya a huge success and that we shouldn't pay attention to what happened to that consulate in Benghazi. So, of course, it must be true. And no, it isn't. Up in Ukraine, separatists have shot down two Kiev helicopters. Uh, and uh, apparently uh, 14 people were killed, uh, among them General Sergei Kulchik, who was the guy who apparently ordered the bombing of the psychiatric hospital residential neighborhoods in Slovyansk. Now, this war has already gone to total war. They're not being careful to kill the separatists. They're killing everybody. They're using heavy artillery and airstrikes. These are very non-discriminatory methods of simply killing large numbers of people. The right sector militants who are not formally a part of the Kiev military have asked the government in Kiev to give them heavy weapons to go in and do what they're going to do here. So right now we are hearing that there are large-scale military operations involving artillery in Slavyansk and Kramatorsk. They're just shelling the place into submission to bring them back into the slavery of the European Central Bank. Apparently, and this is a story we got out of Global Search up in Canada, uh, Polish mercenaries uh, are inside Ukraine, possibly at the behest of the Central Intelligence Agency, because they're having a really hard time getting the regular Kiev army to go out and kill their fellow countrymen. In fact, uh, uh, Kiev has instituted what amounts to a draft. They're grabbing these conscripts, giving them guns, and say, go kill your friends and neighbors over there on the other side of this line, and they're not doing it. Apparently, uh, 80 of them surrendered to the Donbass self-defense forces, and they've gone over to the other side. Meanwhile, we're getting a report that Russian naval aviation has increased their overflights of the Black Sea to keep an eye on what all those NATO U.S. warships might be up to, which, of course, strikes me as a very, very prudent thing. And here is the punchline, okay? Here's the punchline. All of this began when the elected president of Kiev decided he did not want to join the European Union, wanted to go with Russia, do business with Russia. So the U.S. sends in all these front groups, they kick up violence, they, they, they force the elected government from power by force, they install a new junta by force, then they stage this obviously bogus election to, to try and give themselves an aura of legitimacy. Yes, yeehaw, we just voted ourselves back into power here. All these people being killed, all these people dying, all the destruction to infrastructure, and here's the punchline. The President Poroshenko is now saying he wants to postpone joining the European Union because his economists are saying that without Russia's buying of products from Ukraine, their economy will absolutely collapse. Europe is not in a position to buy these products from Ukraine, neither is the United States. And so now we have the new regime change president, Poroshenko, holding off on joining the EU because commerce with Russia is more attractive. That means everything the U.S. government did, everything the European Union did in Ukraine has just fallen apart. Ukraine might still snuggle on up to Russia after all of this was over and done with. All those people dead for no purpose, all that destruction for no purpose. If there, there wasn't so much blood all over it, we could laugh at this development. Absolutely. Over in Afghanistan, following on President Obama's once again reneging on his promise to bring our kids home, we're seeing this article over there from RIMF.com where basically the United States is planning a permanent occupation of Afghanistan. Got to keep that oil for sale only for the U.S. dollars. Got to keep that opium flowing onto the streets of America for all those American drug lords and the CIA to make money off of. But it turns out there's another reason why all of a sudden Obama wants to keep your kids in Afghanistan. And when we come back from these commercials, I will share what that is. And aloha, America. Welcome back to the show. We're talking about Afghanistan and Obama's endless broken promises to end that war and bring our kids home and they're not going to do it because the real reason we went into afghanistan initially was over a pipeline all the way back in 1994 this consortium of oil companies wanted to build a pipeline through afghanistan 
uh, to take oil and gas from the Caspian Sea down to a shipping terminal on the Indian Ocean. And the, the Taliban said, okay, well, you know, we'll grant you the right of way for a pipeline. This is how much we want for it. And the oil company said, no, 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 no. No, we will decide what we're going to pay you for the pipeline. And there was the stalemate. So this oil company consortium went over to the United States Congress. And one of the representatives for Unical was Hamid Karzai. Remember that name. And they literally said, it will be less expensive for us to harvest the oil and gas if you change the government in Afghanistan. And that was the reason Afghanistan was first on the list of countries to be invaded following 9-11. So they invaded Afghanistan. The oil companies got their pipeline. American drug lords got a new source of opium because under the Taliban, Afghan opium had simply vanished. They had a very hard line about those poppy fields. And, of course, it guaranteed that Afghanistan's oil would be for sale only for the U.S. dollar, that whole petrodollar thing. Well, if you're wondering why Obama has once again broken his promise to bring our kids home and wants to keep a permanent U.S. presence in Afghanistan, it's because they've just discovered huge deposits of lithium and gold in Afghanistan. And you know how desperate the New York Federal Reserve is to get their hands on any gold they can. Remember, one week after Germany asked for their gold back from the Bank of France and the New York Federal Reserve, France invaded Mali, Africa's third largest gold provider. It doesn't get any more obvious than that. So now there's gold and then there are Afghan hills. So, of course, your kids are going to be sent over there to be killed and crippled because those bankers, they need that gold. They've got to make good on, uh, on all of that. And, by the way, I have a new theory where all the gold in the vaults went. I'm going to be talking about that a little bit later in the show. Meanwhile, we got a phone call. Art off the grid. Aloha, Art. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hey, Mike. I'm kind of curious, you know, talking about, you know, the Ukraine and, and you know, uh, this this deal with Russia to trade in their own currencies and stuff. And how, well, of course, we know the United States just doesn't want that because, heaven forbid, they should use anything beyond the dollar. Mm-hmm. But here's what I don't understand, and this is the same argument I used when they kept talking about uh, Iran and its nuclear power programs to have good, safe nuclear power to, you know, for your refrigerators and things like this. Um, You know, we could say, why didn't uh, Ahmadinejad or the current president, uh, why didn't they just keep throwing out, look, you guys, why you guys and and Israel have violated every aspect of the the, uh, non-proliferation treaty, so you know, why should we give a Rasputin what any of you say? Here's what Kiev should do, or what uh, what uh, 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 the Ukraine should do uh, in dealing with this issue, trying to, you know, have this deal with Russia to use their own currencies to trade amongst themselves. Just look at the United States, and anyone who wants to promote we got to stay on the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency, just say, look, you guys have violated every aspect of the Bretton Woods Agreement. Now, if you can't even live up to your own obligations under an agreement, which you willingly signed saying you promised not to do this and you turned around and did it anyway, you reneged on the deal. So we're not going to play in your sandbox. It's that simple. Well, because what the United States turns around and does and says, you know, if you don't go along doing what we want, we will invade and destroy your country. That's what they've been trying to send a message with ever since they went in and lynched Saddam Hussein for daring to sell Iraq's oil for the euro. Uh, The problem is that as the U.S. continues to bog down in Iraq and Afghanistan, as Libya looks to fall out of U.S. control, uh, more and more countries are beginning to realize that, hey, the U.S. threat of military force to keep us on the dollar and the petrodollar uh, appears to be more and more a gigantic bluff. And that's why we have the Shanghai Cooperative uh, uh, Association is forming. You've got the BRICS nations. There are 80 nations signed up with that. You've got, a, at last count, 132 nations want to disconnect from that global private central banking cartel. It's all coming apart right now. And the only thing propping up the dollar in international trade right now is that threat of U.S. military force. Well, I, I don't really I, – here's, here's the thing. Even if they, you know, they they can make all the threats they want. But here's the thing. If if they start making these kind of threats that we're going to, 
bomb you to oblivion or whatever if you don't stay with the U.S. dollar? What, Putin's going to sit back for that? I, I think Putin would say, well, if you think, if, if you think for one second you've got what it takes, bring it on. Well, Putin doesn't want a bring war. Putin doesn't want a war. Remember, uh, the, the two world wars were not fought on U.S. soil. They were fought over there in Europe and in Russia, where they remember. There are still people alive who remember World War II, and they don't want another one. I'll tell you what I think Putin is probably going to do at the point where they think the U.S. is really getting ready to start launching more wars to drag people back to Bretton Woods. What they'll do is tell all 80 of the nations aligned with BRICS on the same day, drop the dollar. And that will absolutely bring it all crashing down. Well, I don't believe that Putin wants a war. I mean, I don't think any of us with any common sense wants a war. Oh, the bankers want but, a war. You know, I'm, the bankers I'm, love war. Well, the bankers want a war, yeah. But see, I'm not a violent person, and anyone who knows me will tell you I will go out of my way to avoid physical conflict at any time. But, Mike, I cannot tell you how many times I have avoided violent confrontation by simply looking at people threatening me and telling them, if you think you can take me, Consider this your invitation. No, Putin's not going to do that. that. Putin's not going to do that. Okay? Um, Art, 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 going to let you go here. Coming up on a commercial break, and I want to make a very important point here. Okay? Putin is not going to be the belligerent party. Neither is Iran. The belligerence is all on the side of Washington, D.C. and Tel Aviv and the European Union, which is crumbling as we speak. They're trying to get the conflicts going to reassert U.S. hegemony over the world, at least economically and in terms of what currencies will be trading, uh, resources will be trading in. That's the real goal here. Uh, these other nations are trying to low-key it, tone it down, pull it back. We saw that with uh, Putin dealing with the Syrian situation to undermine the uh, planned U.S. invasion there. Putin's a chess player, and our government in Washington, D.C., they like to play poker or hearts, to bluff with, or maybe tiddlywinks, to judge by some of the quality of thinking coming out of the nation's capital right now. Uh, but Putin is not going to take any kind of a confrontational tone. He won't back down. What he'll do is sidestep and come in from an unexpected direction. And I would not be surprised to see a coordinated move among all these nations to drop the dollar at the same time, because what's the U.S. going to do? Uh, attack and invade 80 nations all at the same time? I don't think it's really going to work. And um, we might see all of these nations that have gold bullion theoretically being stored at the New York Federal Reserve all come in and demand an audit on the exact same day. Either one of those would bring the entire system crashing down. And I'm sure the U.S. in their private discussion with all these other countries is saying, if you push this issue, we'll have to do something militarily. You know, you mess with us, we're going to mess with you. All right, we've got to take a break for... Uh, some commercials. We'll be back with more about what's going on down in Africa. Aloha, America. Welcome back to the show here. Boy, the phone lines are really loading up today. We're going to go to John in Tennessee. Aloha, John. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind today? Uh, hello, Michael. You were talking about the uh, Afghan pipeline, and what came to mind was the Silk Road Caucus with Brownback and Condoleezza Rice and others from Chevron and Congress that were determined to build the pipeline to get the uh, minerals and oil out of the Caspian Sea. But I didn't know uh, until recently that actually the bombing that took place in the Afghan mountains were right along the old ancient Silk Road to make preparation, I believe, for the pipeline. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, from an engineering point of view, it makes sense to use the remains of an already existing uh, path uh, you know, to run the pipeline through rather than to have to carve or blast a new one through the mountains. So I don't think there's anything uh, at all unusual about that kind of an approach. Well, what I, what I found interesting is that, I did, see, I didn't know that they had actually completed the pipeline. I know that the road had been built or was in process of being built, but I thought that the only other uh, route that I could see on a map, or at least with my knowledge of geography was Iraq from the Caspian to the Arabian through Iraq. So mm -hmm. I thought that we might have gone to Iraq. Well, the, the pipeline the, complete? 
Uh, yeah, they, they've completed the pipeline uh, running through Afghanistan. And Hamid Karzai, who was a consultant for Unical before Congress in 1994 when this was all being planned, as you know, he is the soon-to-be-leaving office uh, president of Afghanistan, installed by the U.S. military action. Well, something else that's interesting. You call them the money junkies. You know, we go, we go to war with countries that are on our hit list because they haven't yet taken a central bank. One of the first things we do when they lose the war is give them a brand new central bank. They did. They Let's did look. that. They did that in Libya. I mean, the fighting wasn't even over. Gaddafi wasn't even dead, and they shut down the state-controlled central bank and put a brand new private central bank on the ground, issuing all the public currencies alone at interest. Well, the the debtor, the borrower, servant, slave to the lender. So that's what they want. That's exactly yeah. what they want. And they want to do the that that scam to the entire planet with a global government and a global reserve bank privately owned to trap all of mankind permanently in debt servitude. All right. Thank you, Michael. Okay, we're going to switch over to Aaron in Texas. Aloha, Aaron. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Oh, yeah, Michael. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, yeah, just real quick, because uh, I'm at work, so I'm just going to go answer, answer, uh, ask a question and let you uh, uh, talk on it. Um, what is the difference? You, uh, I've always heard the term, um, the bankers win because both sides, they, they finance both sides of the war. Yes. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't this war be financed by the same bankers if Russia and America were to go to war, the United States were to go to war? Basically, uh, uh, well, once the war starts, the bankers have to side with the nation they're already in. And I think a really good example of that would be Brown Brothers Harriman, who financed Adolf Hitler's rise to power. Uh, until the day war was actually declared, at which point Roosevelt nailed them under the Trading with the Enemies Act. But if you remember that private central banks are a global network unto themselves, they're all making money off of both sides, uh, because both sides have to borrow money to fight the war. When the war is over, both sides have to borrow more money to rebuild from the war. And when it's all over, ordinary people like you and I, we've got kind of sort of what we had before, except the graveyards are a lot bigger, and we're back into debt to the bankers for another 100 years. Germany just finished paying off their World War I debt about five years ago. So, of course, it's time for a new world war. Can't let these countries yeah, and, get off of debt. Yeah, and one more thing, Michael, before I let you go. Um, what if the United States was to rise up and have a revolution here? Do uh, you think maybe other countries would support us with weapons and ammunition and stuff like that the same way we supported other nations? Well, I think what we would see is the other nations that are enslaved to private central banks would come in on the side of the U.S. government, and those nations that are not enslaved to private central banks would come in on the side of the people. I personally hope to avoid a bloody revolution in this country, and I continue to counsel. The system is tearing itself apart. Just stay calm, stay patient. It's going to implode all on its own. Let us not give this government an excuse to declare a national emergency and martial law and suspend what little remains of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Thank you, Michael. I love your show. Keep up the good work, sir. I will do my best. We're going to switch over to Dustin in New Jersey. Aloha, Dustin. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hi, Mike. You're absolutely right. Putin, the art of fighting without fighting. I want everybody to pick up the book, The Art of War. We're going to implode. Putin's just going to sit back and watch. Because our debt, the West's debt, is unsustainable, and we have more and more debt every year. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. It can't stop. It's in the system. The, the, the damage is already done. It's in the system. So he's just going to wait it out. That's what I think. Yeah, he's no, I, I, I think he is. I, I think that's exactly what he's going to do. Uh, and you're right. The reason the debt is unsustainable is that private central banking system, by design, always creates more debt than money with which to pay the debt. It's a built-in, self-destruct system, and the people who set these banks up know it's going to happen eventually. They just want their money now. And they go to their graves happy after lives of unearned wealth and privilege. And it is a huge scam. I mean, we've got this growing scandal here in the United States where the Federal Reserve continues to resist any audit to inform the American people how much wealth this privately owned central bank has made off the backs of the American workers. And now, as I reported yesterday, it turns out the Federal Reserve Banks don't pay any income taxes to the federal government, to the state government. The only taxes they're required to pay are the real estate taxes on the ground underneath their buildings. They're exempt from all these other taxes. It's right there in the Federal Reserve Act. 
it's feudalism. That's pretty much a you can go out and raid your village, take your women, take your goats, kill you. That's and, and then tax you and then tax you. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly the model they're trying to move back to where where the nobility owns everything and you spend your life working to pay rent to them. And that's exactly what they want. They're, they they are absolutely dead set serious about ending Thomas Jefferson's experiment with, you know, a, a government that serves the people. You know, he's very close to the Chinese. He has a lot of their, he believes in a lot of their philosophy. And remember, China had their own problems with fiat currency. They've been around for a long time. So they know what happens. Every, all fiat currencies collapse, so ours is no different. doesn't matter if you're over here or around the world. It, it's all, it all collapses, the fiat currency. So they know, he knows, and they're going to wait it out, and, you know, we'll collapse from within, and then we'll, t- you know, take it from there if America had enough by then. You know, American people got to start speaking out. I, I keep getting mad. The American people should call the show, talk to their friends, talk to people about what's going on, mm-hmm. And American people need to start doing some research, not believing, you know, CNN and their winner and the economy. I, 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 you look at CNBC, it's all the economy. Oh, it's, it's you know, it's cold out. You know, it's, I, that's, I saw that today. I was looking. I was just... Well, you know, uh, to, to get back to what we're talking about, about these fiat debt-based currencies, uh, the reason the scam is so easy to uh, perpetrate, to start up, is because these uh, people who are in the governments at the time, like Woodrow Wilson and the U.S. Congress 100 years ago, uh, they're lured in by the promise of instant f- waterfalls of new money that they get to play with and spend. And they know that this is being borrowed against future generations of Americans, but from their point of view, hey, not my problem. The problems aren't going to hit till after I'm dead and gone. I don't have to worry about them at all. And that is the core of the sellout and why so many governments get suckered into these things. Now, in the case of the United States of America, we've had three of these private central banks, and all three have brought the nation to the edge of ruin and collapse. And we have occasionally had leaders who were real leaders and real statesmen who understood what the problem was and tried to stop it only to have attempts on their life by the bankers i just want to say one thing about gold and silver if people can't afford an ounce of gold you can pick up a gram of gold and, and an ounce of silver i mean that's your insurance you're not buying it to like trade off you know like when, when it goes up in value that's to protect your your value that's like when the current, absolutely your right drops, that's to cover your losses, pretty much. You know, that's it's, it's protection, like insurance. So I, I, I tell everybody who's listening to get, if you can't afford an ounce of gold, get a gram of gold, get a ounce of silver, a couple ounces of silver. Silver is cheap. You know, it's, it's for your protection, you know? It's a wealth preserver because, again, when the paper currency collapses, that gold and silver will hold its value, and that's why it is still you know, acquired and traded by various governments. And at some point down the line, once the U.S. government gets your guns, they're going to come for your gold and silver. I guarantee you that's what they're thinking. We have to take another break for commercials. Dustin, we're going to let you go here, and we will be right back. Aloha, America, and well, welcome back to the show. And, of course, over in Iran, they're not jailing them. They're hanging them. Uh, Iran just executed Iran's richest man, because he made his money the old-fashioned way. He screwed it out of other people. And I'm not a big fan of capital punishment, but at least they're doing something about it. Just like Iceland, when that whole mortgage-backed security fraud thing fell apart, they threw their bankers in prison. What did the U.S. government do? Loot you, the American people, to try and cover the losses. And more about that a little bit later in the show here. Now, the Pentagon is moving to try and control Nigeria. They concocted this whole Boko Haram instant terror group. Remember, when uh, Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, she worked to keep this group off the U.S. government's terrorist organization list. They're being protected. And so they kidnap these girls, and it's just made for media, and they do a videotape. Oh, we're abusing these poor innocent children. Come and get us. And the government of Nigeria is saying, no, we will take care of it ourselves. In fact, the government of Nigeria initially reported that those girls had already been sent home. After the cameras stopped rolling, thank you, here's a cookie, go. 
and was just another one of these endless hoaxes the U.S. government plays on you to trick you into throwing your children onto the bayonets of this week's designated enemy. And what's going on in Nigeria and all across Africa is control of the resources. And if you go back and look at the history of Nigeria, it's always U.S. policy to support the big oil corporations like Shell Oil that are inside Nigeria. And they've imposed a harsh dictatorship, and the people of Nigeria are are just fed up with it. So they want to go back in there and bring democracy to these people, whether they want it or not here. Now, in a classic study of foregone conclusions, Egypt's foreign military chief, who led the coup d'etat against the elected Morsi, uh, has won we think, sort of, kind of, maybe, election to president of Egypt. And he had more than 92% of the votes. But not very many people turned out. I mean, for this guy to get 92% of the votes, and first of all, remember, they outlawed the opposition party. This would be like the Republicans getting control of the Congress and the White House and then saying, the Democrats are now banned. We're going to ban them. We don't want to deal with them any longer. And from then on, it's always Republican, Republican, Republican. Some of the people in Egypt who refused to join the election, to p- participate, remember, they were, they were threatening to shoot people who wouldn't go to the polls. And they said, basically, this guy, is, he's another Mubarak, which is exactly what the United States wanted. Morsi was not obedient He was standing up to the United States. He stood up to Israel. So, of course, we've got a regime, change him out of there, and put in somebody who will do what he's told to do. Same pattern we've been seeing for the last 60 years carried out by the United States, only now the world understands that's what's been going on. That's the reason there are wars and revolutions and coup d'etats all over the globe, is the United States going in and just mucking about. And that's the reason America is so hated around the world. They don't hate us for our freedoms. People love to be free. Only rulers hate freedom for the masses. They want freedom for themselves. But America is hated because it has this bad habit of going into other people's countries and screwing things up for everybody. Now, in contrast to the very low voter turnout over in Egypt... Uh, The opposite was true in Lebanon. Yesterday we put up this amazing picture of just uh, the the crowds, tens of thousands, as far as we can tell, of Syrian refugees living in Lebanon to vote in serious presidential elections. And Bashar al-Assad is already landslide winner, based on the early voting. Now, amazingly enough, there was a YouTube video of that report But YouTube blocked it. They've got the message up there. It's blocked for viewing inside your country. And the reason for that is pretty obvious. The United States government doesn't want you to know that Bashar al-Assad is actually supported by his people because the fundamental justification for three years of covert mercenary warfare to oust Assad is, oh, Assad's an evil tyrant. He's an evil dictator. The Syrian people long to be freed from his evil tyranny and join the evil tyranny of the United States of America and the European Union. And when Assad wins that election, it's just going to destroy the entire U.S. justification for being in there and supporting the mercenary armies. And I think I'm, I'm very concerned, and I hope Assad's security is also concerned, that when he does win this election... Uh, we already know the, the, the U.S. government is going to say, ah, it's illegitimate, we don't recognize the results here. Like, it's up to them, right? They already put out this propaganda that these Syrian refugees in Lebanon are all voting for Assad because they're afraid of him. And that's a pretty obvious and pathetic piece of USDA choice bovine excrement because Syrian elections, like U.S. elections, you don't put your name on the ballot. Nobody knows who you voted for. You're in a little curtain box. You fill it out, you fold it over, you put it in the ballot box, and that's it. Nobody knows how you vote. So this idea that they're all voting for Assad because they're afraid of him. Boy, that's right up there with uh, Saddam's nuclear weapons in terms of a big steaming pile of U.S. government bovine excrement. 
And when Assad is declared the victor in the election, I would not at all be surprised to see an immediate attempt to assassinate him or a decapitation military strike to simply bomb the heck out of wherever they think he's uh, sleeping that night. We might even see some kind of a provocation to launch a military invasion of Syria before the election inside Syria itself can take place. Because if the United States loses Syria, and it looks like they're losing Libya, that's the end of this war for the petrodollar and Bretton Woods. The American people are not going to accept these very obvious and clear defeats and say, yeah, let's go on mucking about with all these other countries. We just love spending our money on these wars, and we just love seeing our children come back in those cheap metal boxes with those American flags made in China. They're getting very, very desperate to maintain control, which is where we got Senator Schumer out there saying, well, the First Amendment should only apply to the corporate control media, and everybody else, the government, can tell you what to write and what to think. Uh, apparently, uh, in this escalation over in the Pacific between uh, China and uh, uh, Vietnam, uh, it's now reported they're deploying nuclear fast attack subs into the region. So that is heating up. Now, as you know, the Bilderberg meeting is once again underway. It's this very super elite coffee clatch where they're going to get together and say, what do we do now? Keith Alexander is attending this year. Thomas Donilon, uh Martin Feldstein, Evan Greenberg, uh, uh, Susan Hockfield, Bruce Katz, Henry Kissinger, of course, he's, he's a fixture there. You know, the New World Order. Here's what's really interesting. Reports from inside the Bilderberg meeting describe the scene as the elites in a panic at what appears to be the impending collapse of their push for a global government and a new world order and a one world bank. Because it's all falling apart. The, uh, the election results in Europe were a devastating blow to this European Union. And, and for all intents and purposes, Britain's basically already pulled out. And it's all starting to come apart. And remember, when the European Union starts to come apart and some of those debts default, there's going to be a firestorm on Wall Street of investors who bought credit default swaps against Europe's debt, pounding on the doors of those Wall Street banks, demanding payment, and Wall Street does not have the cash to make good on those derivatives. So they'll turn around to the U.S. government and say, we need you to loot the American people a little bit more. You know, we didn't mean to do wrong. You know, it's, just, it's those darn Europeans refuse to run their country for our sake. And the U.S. government will agree. And they'll turn around and say, look, give us your silver and gold. we got to cover the losses here. We're going to be right back. And aloha, America. Welcome back to the show here. Now, there's a very bizarre story that came out of Russia today. And they were listening to Obama's speech in which he said the United States is indispensable, implying that any other nation on Earth is dispensable. And I think it betrays this view in Washington, D.C., that the U.S. has indeed become the sole superpower. Now, remember, back in the 1990s, for the, the Project for the New American Century advised as a policy to take advantage of the collapse of the Soviet Union and create a unipolar world centered on the United States. And people are calling him on that one. And the reality is, right now, this so-called indispensable United States has invaded more states in the world, has violated human rights and international law more than any, any other country. Now, remember about a week ago, shortly after um, uh, awarding a judgeship to this lawyer who created the memo, which supposedly says that Barack Obama has an authority under the Constitution of the United States of America to murder any American citizen anywhere in the world for merely being suspected of being a terrorist. And he got this judgeship. He's now in line to eventually be on the Supreme Court. That'll keep you up at night. And uh, in response to all the criticism and, uh, and, and so forth, the White House said they were going to finally release this memo Proving that it is perfectly legal for Obama to assassinate any one of us. 
Well, they've gone back on that one. Now the U.S. government has suddenly moved to classify this memo, to make it a crime to release it. So we have reached the point in dictatorship where there are secret laws that we are not allowed to know about but are expected to go along with. Of course, the only reason for classifying this memo is that whatever is in there is not going to pass any kind of a constitutional examination because the Constitution and the Bill of Rights absolutely do not allow the government to simply kill Americans at whim, or anybody else for that matter. Now, a little while ago, as part of the inquiry into just how we got into that mess in Iraq, the British government had agreed to uh, release the records of conversations between phony Tony Blair and George Bush. Well, now they've backed off on that one, and they, they say they're going to prepare a document of the gist of the discussions meaning they're just going to write it up out of thin air to make themselves look good. The Chilkut inquiry is trying to get at the root of, of just how we wound up in Iraq when there obviously were no weapons of mass destruction. And uh, now uh, they, they were told they were going to get these conversations and transcripts between Tony Blair and George Bush, and now they're backing off and saying, uh, we'll, we'll sort of summarize them for you. You know, and there's hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents. We're just going to fill out this little three by five index card with all that you need to know. Now, getting over to the veteran scandal, this is being reported in Russia today. And I know right now they're trying to get Shinseki to resign. They're going to just dump this all on him and say, well, Shinseki has resigned. The problem is over uh, and, and you don't need to fret about it anymore, especially going into the November elections. But uh, apparently... Uh, What is coming out from the actual investigation is this cooking of the books by the VA has been going on for over six years to hide the fact they were delaying and denying care to the country's veterans. Another examination uh, down at the Phoenix VA shows that there are 1,700 veterans being kept on the hidden wait list and not on the official wait list. And they can't even begin to see a doctor until they're on the official wait list. And a lot of these people are dying before they ever get any medical care for the injuries they sustained in service to the private central bankers wrapped in the flag. So... For those of you considering military service, and again, John Stewart made a valid point on The Daily Show about a week ago. It has been going on all along. It's part of the nation's history. When you are healthy and fit and able to go out and kill the people the government wants killed and invade the countries the government wants invaded and seize the natural resources the government wants seized, they'll give you guns and body armor and all kinds of stuff. They'll spend all kinds of money on you on your training. But once once you're wounded and you're of no more use to them, they don't want to spend another penny on you. And it has been going on all along. And this is not going to end with Shinseki's resignation. He's just the scapegoat. He's the sacrificial lamb that they're going to throw to the wolves, let him get good and bloody and act like they're trying to deal with the situation, but they aren't. Have you seen anybody talk about increasing the funding to the VA to get these delayed patients the treatment they need? No, you haven't, nor will you. The focus is entirely on a wartime economy. They don't want to even admit that's where we are, but we're in a wartime economy. Everything is being neglected so that all the money goes to these wars of conquest. And it's already falling apart. Uh, interesting article over at Joseph Pedo Poetry. He's a poet, but apparently he's paying attention to what's going on. He's raised the possibility that the grieving father in Santa Barbara, who was out there bashing the NRA on the media cameras, may have also played a similar role following Sandy Hook. And he appears to have had a beard in one, clean-shaven in the next, bald in one, very obvious toupee in the other. 
But remember when we had uh, that Hollywood filmmaker on the show a couple of weeks ago, and he said he knew the Boston bombing was a fake because he recognized the actors on the street as people who had, he had worked with in the film and television industry. So now it's beginning to look like they're recycling and reusing the same crisis actors. And, of course, everybody's out there trying to exploit this tragedy. Uh, over in uh, California, Assemblyman Skinner has introduced yet another gun bill, the Gun Violence Restraining Order, which legalizes gun violence restraining orders and firearm seizure warrants issued by California courts on rumor and hearsay. Oh, I think my neighbor's a little bit crazy. All right, we'll take his guns. It's amazing here. MSNBC's Chris Hayes is blaming the California shooting on the open carry and men's rights movement. Remember when feminism really got going in the 1990s and all men are rapists and they're all evil and they're all child molesters and really you just ship them off to die in war because we can't have them in our society. And so they're back to bashing. There's, you know, the men's rights movement is to blame for the California shooting. It's the most absurd thing I've, I, I've ever heard. Gabby Giffords is out there saying Congress has to pass gun control to protect women. They're trying to turn it into a feminist issue. Get out the hip waiters because the bovine excrement has hit the flood stage on this stuff. Now, amazingly enough, back in 2011... No less a publication than Time magazine ran an article saying that these legal prescription psychiatric drugs seemed linked to increased amounts of violence. And they went down the list of the top 10 drugs and actually said people on Luvox are 8.4 times more likely to be linked with violence than with other medications. It's one of the most dangerous ones out there. And by the way, one of the Columbine shooters uh, was on this medication. And time sort of hemmed and hawed and said, we don't know these medications are causing the violence, but there's obviously a statistical correlation that has to be looked at. And they're absolutely right about that. So even back in 20, they've known all along. It's not the guns. It's the drugs. We'll be right back. Aloha, America. Welcome back to the show. Now, a few days ago, we were poking fun at this uh, corporate media bimbo who came out saying that Michelle Obama had signed a particular piece of legislation regarding dietary recommendations. Now, I've read that Constitution, and the president's wife isn't allowed to sign anything. And now CNN has had a bit of an embarrassment uh, because uh, apparently somebody using their, uh, 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 their uh, Anybody Can Post news story put on a story that the Earth would be destroyed by an asteroid on uh, uh, March 2041 and they cnn let the story run in fact people were sending it to me they said that you should post it and said no they can't actually predict the stuff that far out cnn has now had to retract that story and apologize for it they're not really paying much attention over there anymore they've gotten lazy they sit at the computer they get the proclamations from the government they write it up as their own news and they put it on out there now, I want to get back to the situation about the gold, because we've got Germany, now Austria want to audit their offshore gold holdings. In fact, I think Austria brings it now to six nations who have notified the Bank of England, the Bank of France, and the New York Federal Reserve that they want to examine the gold bullion that is being stored for a fee at these bullion vaults. Now, these bullion vaults aren't bank accounts where you put gold in and then the bank takes it out and does what they're going to do with it. These are operated like safety deposit boxes. And these countries and foreign banks are paying a fee, a very stiff fee, for the protection of their gold in these giant vaults. And it's supposed to be there. And it doesn't look like it is. And everybody's wondering, where did it go? And uh, when we were doing... The, uh, the episode, The Gold Conspiracy, for America's Book of Secrets, and we talked about uh, was it being leased out the back door to satisfy gold futures contracts, which were in turn being flooded on the market to suppress gold prices? Certainly one possibility. Was it pledged as collateral on something that went bad and they had to deliver? Maybe. But there's another explanation that's beginning to 
look more and more real. And uh, I'm going to preface it with a couple of flashback stories. Remember back in 2012 when $6 trillion in U.S. gold bonds were seized in Zurich? And they were declared in the media, oh, these are fake, but they're very good fakes. You can't tell them from the real ones. Maybe if they're that good, how do you know they're fake? Oh, take our word for it. They're fake. And then in 2009, there was this strange bearer bond mystery where basically, again, we were told that uh, authorities intercepted these gold bearer bonds. These are certificates of paper where if you're holding this piece of paper, you can go into the U.S. Treasury and remove the gold. And they were just all over the place, all over Europe. And what I think is happening, has been happening to most of the gold from Fort Knox and the New York Federal Reserve, is following the 2008 collapse of the mortgage-backed security fraud. All those foreign governments and foreign banks who had suffered losses from what was provably a criminal fraud enterprise demanded the U.S. government make good. And the U.S. government not wanting a public international scandal that would have destroyed the credibility of the U.S. financial system made good on the losses using other people's gold. And that is why the New York Federal Reserve can't give Germany back their gold, can't even let them look at it, not going to be able to do that for Austria or or any of these other countries. I think those gold vaults are empty, and they were emptied trying to keep the lid on Wall Street's mortgage-backed security fraud collapse in 2008. I think that's where a big chunk of that gold went, because when you look at the value of these gold-bearer bonds that were being transferred around. That's a huge chunk of cash. The 10-year Treasury yield has sunk to a fresh 2014 low. Seven-year Treasury yield drops below 2%. There's a Treasury bond bubble. Every time the Federal Reserve creates another couple of billion dollars to prop up Wall Street stock market or to keep the U.S. government running, there has to be a corresponding printing of Treasury bonds by the U.S. Treasury to send over to the Federal Reserve. They're both printing this stuff up out of thin air and swapping it back and forth to conceal what's really going on. But there's now a Treasury bond bubble. There aren't enough living Americans to make good on all those Treasury bonds that have been issued. And the United States is already having to default on some of those Treasury bonds, primarily the ones held in the Social Security Trust Fund. Because back during the Clinton administration... They dipped into the cash buildup that was being put there for the baby boomer retirement surge, and they spent it as general revenues. And it was called a loan, and they took the cash and replaced it with treasury bonds. And now they can't redeem them. And the U.S. government deliberately defaulted on you, the American worker, because in their eyes, you can't do anything about it. You can't affect the U.S. government's credit rating. You can't repossess. So, yeah, we're just going to screw the American worker here because they can't do a thing about it. Meanwhile, we're seeing more and more commentary about this Eastern energy pivot threatening the United States dollar. What we're seeing the world do economically is a mirror of what they're doing relative to the NSA. Everybody's disconnecting from any Internet service that goes through the United States. They're dropping use of anything having to do with the U.S. computer IT industry because of all the backdoors and spying, and they're doing the same thing economically. BRICS nations have set up to run the economy among themselves without involving the U.S. Same thing with the Shanghai Cooperative uh, Organization. We now have, at last count, 132 nations that are trying to de-link from the global private central banking system. The handwriting is very much on the wall. Countries are dropping the dollar faster than the U.S. can invade them. And I think that if the United States continues to push on Russia, trying to gin up a war to distract us all from this economic mismanagement and outright corruption and fraud, that all Russia has to do is tell the 80 nations aligned with BRICS on this day we will all drop the dollar at the same time. And the whole party will be over. Russia will defeat the United States of America without having to fire a shot. Meanwhile, over in Japan, their government is proposing a new $6 billion gas pipeline from the Sakhalin Islands 
to Japan. This is going to be a huge pipeline, 1,350 kilometers, reaching from the Sakhalin Islands to Hokkaido and Honshu Islands. Now, at the moment, Japan and Russia have an agreement to share the Sakhalin Islands and their resources. But remember what happened with the islands that Japan was sharing with China. The U.S. came in and said, oh, no, 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 those are all your islands, and you should stand up for your right. So, basically, Japan is in a serious situation relative to oil and gas because in the wake of Fukushima, most of their nuclear reactors have been put on hold. But I think they're going to reactivate them now because, remember, yesterday we reported that on Japan's Nuclear Regulatory Commission went through a reorganization, and the the, the one member who was a serious critic of nuclear power was removed and replaced with a nuclear industry advocate. So they're already getting ready to hem and haw and say, well, yeah, Fukushima was bad, but we've got to have those nuclear reactors. Now, Armenia is seeking to join the Eurasian Economic Union. This is the new union that's forming up around Russia, China, and Iran. And now Armenia wants to join with them. They're they're, they're fleeing the U.S. sinking ship. And there's a new global economy coming into being that is not centered on the United States, not centered on Wall Street, not centered on London, not centered on any nation with a private central bank. We've got to take a break. We'll be right back. Aloha, America. Welcome back to the show. We're going to take a phone call here. Mike in Michigan. Aloha, Mike. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Aloha, Mike. I just tuned in, so I don't know how much you've spoken about the Edward Snowden uh, interview last night. But I watched it very carefully, and I was curious to see how he would respond regarding those questions on 9-11. I first started visiting your website after 9-11 to get the truth about it and learned a great deal about my government and about what transpired that day and watching him react. um, And, you know, something else, you know, 9-11 is the litmus test. And I realize it's a very sensitive topic, and a lot of people are watching him, but Honestly, I feel like it is uh, Julian Assange redux. I want your thoughts on that. Well, basically, uh, you must have been watching a replay because during the live broadcast, NBC cut out that whole section about 9-11. And what Snowden said about 9-11, he didn't want to go into what really happened on that, but he was hammering home a point. He said all of this phone and computer surveillance was already going on on 9-11, So there was no way the government didn't know it was going to be happening. And I think that's a very, very valid point uh, to be making right now. Uh, I think Snowden Snowden was, I think Snowden is savvy enough to understand that if he'd gone in and said 9-11 is a false flag, he would have opened up a means for the NBC host to attack him because it was a hostile interview. There's no question about that. I, t- I totally agree with you, and I didn't. I still didn't expect him to do that. And I thought he would have hurt the, his whole mission had he done something like that. And I do remember reading that comment on your website earlier this morning about that portion that they had edited out. Mm-hmm. But my point is, I you know, as I watched this though, I mean, the guy terrified me. There was nothing in that interview that I didn't read on your website five years ago. <laughs> and I, I'll tell you something, and that's my point though. It's like he's letting out all this quote unquote sensitive information that. Anybody who spent time not watching the mainstream media already knows. It just was like I was looking at my phone as he talked about that one breaker phone and how they could turn it on and it can test my heartbeat and you know they can they can think ahead of. I mean, it, they were it was terrifying listening to him talk to me that way. Well, you know, and you know, what, think- the value of Edward Snowden is yes, we in the independent media have known about all this snooping going back to the Echelon system of the 1980s, but we were a very tiny minority of people aware of the truth. Snowden basically made it a global issue where now everybody knows it's going on all over the world. And so uh, I'm in agreement with those who say, yeah, he is a hero. And so far he has not done or said anything uh, to, to, to give me a, a cause to think that he's some kind of a limited hangout or taking us in the wrong direction. Because as you say, everything that he has been saying, we already had here at whatreallyhappened.com. He hasn't contradicted any of our uh, information. He hasn't said, oh, no, that, that's loony, it's only this. Uh, and uh, again, Snowden was saying, yes, the NSA is recording the audio of phone calls. Uh, Back when the official story from the U.S. government was metadata only, now a week ago, the NSA is finally admitting, yes, we've been recording the audio on the phone calls. So uh, Snowden, uh, yeah, they're they're playing catch-up to Edward Snowden. 
I agree. And with just one final point regarding that 9-11 edit that they did, and I totally agree with you that had he gone out and said, hey, look, there's a lot more to 9-11 the American public needs to know, you know, that would have been a little bit too far. And But I honestly don't believe he went far enough. To not acknowledge that high members of our government actively participated in this event. And by the way, I mean, if the Well, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it one second. You're forgetting something, okay? Uh, Edward Snowden may have said a lot more things that NBC just felt could not be allowed out either, uh, you know, during uh, uh, the original broadcast or during the version that was uh, released on the website. Uh, because it wasn't actually a live feed from Russia. They recorded the interview, then flew it back, edited it, and made it ready for broadcast. So we don't know what Edward Snowden really said or how far he did go. I would love, I, I'm really looking forward to the next uh, the next release where they talk about, they're going to name names, who, who they're spying, spying on, and see what the reaction of that is. It was interesting to see how Congress kind of looked like they were going to go after the NSA and rein them in, and that all went to crap. And well, probably all those members of a... probably all those members of Congress are getting late night phone calls saying, "Hey, do you remember how you cheated on your wife back in 1992? We've got photos and videos of it and recordings of your phone calls. And uh, if you go after the NSA, we'll make them public." I mean, that's the real <laughs> danger of this NSA spying on everybody. They're spying on our politicians. They're spying on our Supreme Court judges. They're spying on everybody to to basically get them to toe the the NSA's line. And just the, just thinking that they have that capability, I believe, has altered everybody's, you know, opera, uh, modus operandi. You know, I mean, I don't, I'm very careful about what I put on, on the Internet now. I'm very careful about text messaging and things that I put out there as a result of this without even having any evidence that, you know, anybody has turned on my phone without me knowing or listened in on me or just, just the idea that they can do that. Um, well, that, that's common nice sense. That's common sense. But it isn't just the Internet and the phones. The NSA has backdoors into all of our desktop computers where they can come in through the router, through the firewall, and look at your private files on your hard drive that you have not made public on the Internet. That's how pervasive it really is. Doesn't sound like we're going to stop them, but uh, I'd love to hear uh, any ideas that you think might be on the horizon. Well, I, I, I think when the economic crash finally happens and there's no more money flowing to NSA and they're just going to have to fire all their people, and uh, I think we ought to convert all those data centers into a, uh, 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 a, a grand version backup utility, uh, you know, or yeah. else shut them down, sell all the hard drives for surplus. I can always use more disk storage here. But i got to tell you, everybody who violated the constitutional rights of Americans needs a good, thick coat of tar and feathers. <laughs> Thanks for taking the call, Mike. Have a great day. All right. We're going to switch over to Steve in California. Aloha, Steve. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Well, Michael, you always talk about uh, certain websites, and I, I guess I don't get it down fast enough, but could you inform us what websites you go to get your daily information, your news, so we can all kind of keep up on that too? Well, I go to a great many different websites. I don't rely on any one. Uh, obviously, or off the top of my head, uh, Al Jazeera, uh, Russia Today, uh, uh, basically uh, uh, UK Guardian. Uh, some of their stuff is a little tabloid-esque. But I try and hit the uh, major websites uh, pretty much around the world to sort of get an overview about, about what's going on. And then I turn on the American media here on this monitor to find out what they're lying about today, which tells me what I should be paying attention to. Right. Hey, one other comment on these, uh, the uh, Chocolate King winning the presidency in Ukraine there. Uh, I mean, it's kind of uh, interesting that he's able to hold on to his, uh, his media, his, uh, his news station. So, you know, you got corruption kind of right, built right in there. Oh, it absolutely is. And by the way, that whole Chocolate King thing is just a propaganda label. And yes, he, he has bought and owns a chocolate company, but he didn't start it. He doesn't get in there and formulate the chocolate. Uh, he basically comes from a family that's very heavily into uh, corruption and organized crime. We posted an expose on that uh, yesterday on the website. Apparently his father was helping uh, corrupt members of Ukraine's former government launder their ill-gotten gains and uh, made a huge amount of money from that. And we know many political dynasties are started that way. The Kennedy dynasty began with old Joe Kennedy, who was a, a bootlegger, made his money right. during Prohibition. Very much so. True. Thank you. All right. All righty then. Now, interesting little story. This has to do with the California Raisins. Remember the California Dancing Raisins was a huge hit 
They were even selling dolls of them now. Apparently, uh, the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals finally came to a ruling regarding the U.S. Department of Agriculture confiscating 47% of a raisin farmer's harvest without compensation. Look at the bottom of that Fifth Amendment. Private property shall not be taken for government use without just compensation. Well, the USDA came in, confiscated 47% of this raisin farmer's crop, and destroyed it in an effort to prop up and support raisin prices by creating an artificial shortage. Okay? So this decision from the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the USDA did not violate the Fifth Amendment because their motive was to drive up crop prices which would have benefited the farmer and that he would not have financially suffered. That's their justification. Now, the part I have a problem with right now is we have millions of hungry Americans in this country, and the USDA is confiscating and destroying real food simply to drive prices up. Does that make any sense at all? It doesn't to me. We should have plentiful, cheap food in this country so that everybody is able to have a meal instead of this artificial shortage game to make the food corporations more profitable. Speaking of food corporations, uh, Artisan Salami, you've probably seen them. They're they're a product that's all across the United States, uh, and it's a very, very good product. And, uh, oh, I'll I'll tell you the story when we come back. This is another example of complete, out-of-control government overreach. We'll be right back. Aloha, America. Welcome back to the show here. Now, we're talking about a company called Bolzano Artisan Meats. And they are, or were, up in Wisconsin. Uh, They sell all across the country. Uh, They made a very fine product. Uh, We even bought and used them here. And for many years... Uh, They were using fermentation and drying to create their uh, meat products. And they were considered a model of this kind of a business by the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection. Everything looked to be hunky-dory. They even had some of these inspectors coming over on their own time to look around to see, okay, this is the example of what it should be like, and we'll now go on and inspect these other plants. Apparently, however, Balzano accidentally uncovered that the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection, either intentionally or just out of incompetence, was interfering with regulatory and food safety information that DATCP needed to get to the USDA and the USDA intended to get to plants. Information was being messed around with. And when Balzano went public with that, DATCP came down on them like a ton of bricks, ordering recalls of all of their products, refusing to let Balzano sell their current inventory or what they had in production, even though it wasn't part of the recall and basically drove this company out of business. And they're going to destroy $50,000 worth of the world's finest salami in a country with millions of Americans going hungry. Does that make any sense at all? And the answer would have to be absolutely not. What's going on here is really very simple. All of these government workers understand the economy is in the Al-Qaeda. And they understand governments are looking for places to cut costs and let government workers go. And government workers don't want to lose their job. Because if they go do the exact same job in the private sector, it's an automatic 30 to 50% cut in pay. And so we have all these little minor bureaucratic annoyances swarming across the country looking for anything that they can get involved in to prove that they're essential to the smooth running of the United States of America. We had a a letter that was uh, in our website uh, yesterday about this guy who's living on a farm and it's fenced and he's got these dogs and they're very happy and local government came in and said, oh, no, no, you've got to have a kennel and you've got to have the roof and you've got to have this or we're going to take your dogs away from you. Even though the dogs are obviously very happy and very well cared for. These bureaucrats are not interested in making your life simpler or easier or beneficial. They're there tinkering with your life. 
interfering with your life, harassing you because they want to keep their jobs and they need to look like they're doing something useful. Except, of course, for those order processors over at the Obamacare website who are being paid money to sit around and do nothing all day long. Now, over in California, once again, the California lawmakers rejected another bill that would have required labels on food made with genetically modified organisms. It's the second time in two years the legislation has failed. And that tells you who the California lawmakers are working for, and it is not the people of California. Monsanto is using every bit of its financial and political clout to hide from you what you are eating. And if there is a fundamental human right... It is to know what one is eating, putting in one's body. To know what it really is, truth in labeling. And now we have corporations and government that want to sell you products. They don't want you to know what's in there. It's none of your business. Just buy it and swallow it. That's all you need to know. If it makes you sick, our partners in crime over at the pharmaceutical industry, they've already got a pill to sell you. It's even worse over in Great Britain. In Great Britain... You can now only buy heirloom seeds, meaning non-GMO seeds, if you are part of a private member's club. The European Commission, this is going to be all over the EU, they're drawing up a new law to regulate the sale of all seeds. And if you want non-GMO seeds, you have to join a private member's club. They will not be available in your local home and garden store. I mean, even Hitler didn't come into people's homes and say, you will plant this plant, you will have this flower, you will have this vegetable. Boy, I'll bet you these private members clubs are going to be jumping up all over the place. When they have to work this hard to hide GMO from you, when they have to work this hard to force you to use GMO, it tells you they know there's a problem. But they've invested way too much money in GMO to let a little thing like the harming the public health get in their way. They just see those huge guaranteed profits out there, which, by the way, aren't guaranteed. Nations around the world are rejecting U.S. agricultural exports. They don't want to have anything to do with it. Corn exports to China have plunged by 85%. China just quit doing business with the U.S. because they keep ordering GMO-free corn. They get GMO corn and say, you guys are trying to pull a fast one on us. Now they're going to Brazil. Voters in Northern California are actually going to be voting uh, to, to the counties, uh, voting on whether they want to secede from the rest of California and form the 51st state. Personally, I think all 50 states ought to secede from Washington, D.C. right now. And they're still out there pushing global warming. Lake Superior had record ice in May. More ice than at any other time since records were kept. But Al Gore and Obama, they still want their carbon tax and want you to buy the carbon credits. Somebody did an analysis of how much carbon dioxide has really increased in the atmosphere. And to put it in perspective, uh, the equivalent of uh, additional atmospheric CO2, it's increased by one part in 10,000. And to put that in perspective, that's like going to the Bernabeu Stadium in Madrid, which is one of the world's largest stadiums, and cramming in seven more people. That's how little CO2 has gone up. And, of course, we're here on the, the, you know, the tail end of yet another record-setting winter, and still they're out there global warming. Obama had his climate assessment. You're all going to broil to death if you don't pay a carbon tax here. Uh, over at Stephen Goddard, WordPress.com, global sea ice area is growing by the area of France every eight months. Now, the carbon Nazis have finally acknowledged they can't go on saying the ice caps are shrinking, the ice caps are shrinking, because too many people have access to the satellite photos of the polar regions. And it's very obvious they're getting bigger. But they are, these are not people who are ever going to admit their theory was wrong. They're not going to back off, and so we saw this particularly onerous piece of propaganda over at sciencemag.org saying changes to wave height 
are promoting ice formation. And the world is getting warmer. Take our word for it. But the growing ice is because the ocean waves have changed. And it is amazing the lengths the carbon Nazis will go to to not have to admit their theory of human-caused global warming has not proven out. To not admit that we're actually in a cooling period. Because the real agenda is to get you to buy carbon credits, on which they make money, or get you to pay a carbon tax, which Obama is desperate to get because Obamacare has cratered as a source of revenue. And they're supported by legions of people who bought into the religion of human-caused global warming, and now they can't bring themselves to admit they were made fools of by Al Gore. They can't admit they were wrong. They'll go to their graves screaming about human-caused global warming. We'll have to dig a hole in the ice to bury them. Story over at naturalnews.com talking about the artificial immunity from vaccines may not be all that good. And that in point of fact, because the body will overreact to these vaccines, they're actually causing a lot more damage. Debilitating conditions. Peanut anaphylaxis is a big one. For some reason, the vaccine makers wanted to use peanut oil as an adjuvant. Now, an adjuvant is an additive to a vaccine to provoke an immune response from the body. And uh, the idea being that it will recognize the pathogen in the vaccine and have immunity to that. But at the same time, it's triggering this peanut anaphylaxis that's afflicting our entire country, where people are just dying if they breathe peanut dust. We'll be back after our top-of-the-hour blurb with James Fetzer. And aloha, America. Welcome back to our show, hour number three. The phone lines are open, 800-313-9443. Dan, the man, is in our control room. And joining us on the phone is James Fetzer. James, aloha. Welcome to the show. Oh, hey, Mike. I'm delighted to be here. Well, Sherwood Ross referred me to you regarding a book written by Jim Norvell, who is sadly no longer with us, uh, which contains some rather interesting information about Lee Harvey Oswald and uh, a foiled earlier attempt to assassinate John F. Kennedy in Chicago. Could you, could you sort of fill us in on that? Yeah, well, Abraham Bolden, who was the first black Secret Service agent, has published a book called The Echo from uh, Dealey Plaza, in which he describes how the attempt to take out JFK in Chicago was thwarted on the basis of information provided by an informant by the name of Lee, we know that he was working then as an informant for the FBI, that he had informant number 179 was being paid $200 a month right up to the time of the assassination, which was independently established by Wagoner Carr, the attorney general of Texas at the time, who launched his own investigation. It's the sort of thing that was so troubling to Lyndon and others that they formed the Warren Commission to preempt independent investigations. But Lee appears to have been the person who provided the information about the Chicago attempt. Well, you know, what's really interesting is in Oliver Stone's movie, JFK, there is mention of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald meeting with an FBI agent and providing some information, but then the FBI agent being ordered to destroy the notes from the meeting. So it it does uh, look like Lee Oswald probably was an FBI informant. He was working to prevent the assassination of John F. Kennedy, and maybe the assassins figured out he was the snitch. That's why they set him up to be the patsy in Dallas. Well, I think they spent a lot of time setting him up. The CIA was running a false defection program. There were members of various services who defected to the Soviet Union and who, you know, uh, came back to be troubled persona located in various places around the U.S. where they could be invoked as patsy. So I think that the whole business with Lee... Uh, reflects a history with U.S. intelligence. He appears to have been recruited by the Office of Naval Intelligence where he was still a recruit in San Diego, where I supervised recruit training myself and marksmanship on the same rifle range, Edson Range Camp Pendleton, where he took his training. Then he was stationed at the most secure base in the American military arsenal at Atsugi, Japan, the source of U-2 overflights. His pseudo-defection to the Soviet Union appears to have been to provide Russians with information about the altitude of the U-2 overflights because they knew they were taking place but couldn't do anything about it, not knowing the altitude. And then, of course, you know, uh, not long before a summit between Eisenhower and Khrushchev was to take place, Khrushchev accused the United States of spying on the Soviet Union. Eisenhower denied it, but Khrushchev was able to produce the pilot and parts of the plane which was most embarrassing for Eisenhower, led to the aborting of the summit and increased Cold War tensions instead of reducing them. 
when Oswald returned to the United States, he was not treated as a traitor. He wasn't subjected to interrogation. Instead, he was met by a CIA front organization, provided him money to relocate where Marina wound up in Dallas, and he wound up in New Orleans, where he was being sheeped after given a false persona again as a pro-Castro communist sympathizer handing out pamphlets for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee but actually associating with, you know, right-wingers and former FBI agent Guy Bannister, as, as Oliver Stone very well portrays in his film JFK. Uh, it, it is rather interesting. You know, I look back on that, and I was, uh, I think I was eight years old when uh, uh, John F. Kennedy was assassinated, and it's one of those events where you remember the day it happened. And uh, I bought the official cover story, the Warren Report, and the rest of it. And it wasn't until Jim Garrison brought out his uh, uh, trial against Clay Shaw, who was later on admitted to have been a CIA contract agent, that I dug out all those magazines I'd saved from the assassination. And for the first time, I took a real good look at them, and I saw that James Altgen photo of the moment Kennedy's grabbing his throat. And you can see Oswald standing in the doorway wearing exactly the same clothes that he was wearing when he was arrested later in the day. Uh, there's, there's other frauds in those magazines. They staged the shot uh, that supposedly uh, sold the magic bullet theory, uh, and it's not even taken from the Texas School Book Depository. You can see that building on the right-hand side of the field. Uh, they shot this thing from the second floor of the Daltex building. And looking back on it, I think it took something like 30 years for half of Americans uh, to finally understand the Warren Report was a complete fiction. And, of course, today in the age of the Internet and the independent media, you can clock the average life expectancy of a government deception with an egg timer, and I think that's a very healthy sign. <laughs> well, you're right on smart, uh, Mike. I mean, I compliment you. Yes, indeed, that is Lee Oswald in the doorway. It's been much disputed. It's the biggest secret about the assassination, because obviously if he was in the doorway at the time of the shooting, he cannot not only have been the lone demented gunman, he can't have even been one of the shooters. You're also right on that three shots, actually, which I believe were the only unsilent shots, were fired with a man like Carcano from the Dow Tex building. All the other shots were silenced to create the acoustical impression of three shots having come from the uh, book depository. But you're right on. They were actually fired from the Dow Tech. Well, uh, it appears there were three shoot teams. There, there was one in the book depository, but not necessarily on the sixth floor, one in the Daltex, and, of course, the one up at the Grassy Knoll. And uh, if I recall correctly, when the House Select Committee on Assassinations uh, was looking at the acoustic evidence from the police dicta belt, uh, they detected seven specific impulses, uh, some of which did triangulate to that Grassy Knoll area. So uh, even the House of Representatives had to acknowledge there were at least two shooters uh, in Dealey Plaza, and at that point, yes, it is a conspiracy. We've got two people conspiring uh, to kill the president. One of the odd things that I mention to my audience all the time is when they put together the Warren Commission, one of the members was John J. McCloy, president of the Chase Manhattan Bank and president of the World Bank, and looking back at all the crimes and corruptions of our banking and finance system, you have to wonder, why was this professional high-level banker on a committee that was supposed to be investigating a homicide, and uh, it, it gets back to Kennedy's signing of Executive Order 11110 and issuing a new government value-based currency, $4.5 billion worth, that Americans could use without having to sacrifice interest to, to that privately owned Federal Reserve. So uh, there were a lot of people who wanted Kennedy uh, dead. Uh, the Israelis were angry with him because he was trying to prevent them from getting nuclear weapons. Organized crime felt he had double-crossed them because they'd helped him steal the election from Richard Nixon. And, uh, 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 and then, of course, he turned around and sicked Robert Kennedy on them. Uh, you had the CIA was angry over the Bay of Pigs uh, fiasco. Uh, and a lot, uh, there were a lot of overlapping motives for the assassination to take place. You're right about all that. John J. McCoy was actually at the ratification meeting at the home of Clint Murkison the night before the assassination. Now, uh, Madeline Duncan Brown, the mistress of Lyndon, who began an affair with him in 48, bore him a son, Stephen, in 1950. And James Norvell speaks extensively about her and about the meeting I'm about to describe. Uh, attended, there were only a couple dozen people, but a lot of heavy heat hitters. J. Edgar Hoover was there. She thought perhaps it had been in his honor. Richard Nixon was there. She remembered he was driven out by a local Republican leader who worked in the same bank building where she was a young advertising 
executive. Uh, John J. McCloy, as you observe, was there, former high commissioner to Germany. He appears to have been representing the Eastern establishment, uh, you know, in support of the Fed, which JFK was effectively circumventing and uh, probably going to abolish. Uh, John uh, uh, George Brown, Brown and Root Heavy Construction, was there when the Vietnam War went down. Brown and Root got a billion dollars to dredge a new port at Conron Bay, uh, which, uh, you know, Vietnam has many magnificent natural ports. I'm quite sure it wasn't necessary. Late in the evening, Lyndon showed up, and the heavy hitters disappeared into a boardroom for 15 or 20 minutes. When it was over, he strode over toward her. She thought he was going to whisper sweet nothings in her ear. Instead, he told her in a hateful tone of voice he wasn't going to have to put up with embarrassment from those Kennedy boys after tomorrow. <laughs> that, that wasn't a threat. That was a promise. And, and you know, uh, it's also true, Mike, that one of the virtues of Jim's book is he actually identifies six different locations from which shots were fired. Okay, uh, we got to take here. a break. James, we got to take a break. I'm sorry to cut you off. We'll be back after this three-minute commercial break. Aloha, America. Welcome back to the show. We're talking with James Fetzer about the John F. Kennedy assassination. And I want to share a quick anecdote with you. I went back and got out my uh, rusty pocket calculator. I was 11 when John F. Kennedy was killed. When I was 8 years old, I was spending a lot of time at my grandparents' home in New Hampshire. And my grandfather uh, was a major figure in Republican politics in New Hampshire. We lived right across the street from Senator Stiles Bridges, who was getting ready to be the, the sort of throwaway candidate uh, against uh, Kennedy uh, when he ran for his second term. You know, they don't, they don't want to risk anybody really important. So uh, Nixon was uh, traveling to New Hampshire to uh, work with Senator Stiles Bridges about how to put together a credible campaign going into the primaries. And then he would come across the street to visit with my grandfather and every time he would do that my mother and grandmother would go out to play bingo because they knew what was going to happen uh, my grandfather and nixon would get into the wild turkey and they'd spend the night just complaining and screaming about them damn kennedy boys so there was a lot of emotionality there uh going on but you're you're absolutely right uh the, the i think at this point any americans objectively looking uh, at what happened back then, realize that, yeah, we got lied to. And uh, when we look at more recent lies like 9-11 or the, the unemployment numbers, uh, or they, they, they've just finally admitted that in point of fact the uh, GDP didn't grow in the first quarter of 2014, I, I think it's time for Americans to realize the government's been lying to you all along about everything. It's just business as usual. And, uh, uh, you know, what do we do when, when we find out the government that takes our money and takes the lives of our children has been lying to us all along? Do we go on allowing our money and our children's lives to be sacrificed to that? Anyway, you were going to tell us more about this uh, little confab that took place uh, the night before the uh, actual assassination. And I remember another story where uh, Nixon was claiming he was nowhere near Dallas at the time, and then somebody got a picture of him. Apparently he was doing something for a soft drink company at a, at a trade show. Right. His cover was he was there for a Pepsi-Cola convention. He was even quoted in the Dallas Morning News the day of the shooting, saying he did not think that uh, JFK would run again with LBJ. In fact, uh, uh, Jack had already infor informed Evelyn Lincoln, his personal secretary, that he wasn't going to run with Lyndon again. He'd already been thinking about Terry Sanford in North Carolina as his running mate. So, uh, you know, N Nixon and George H.W. Bush are the only two individuals I ever encountered who claim they can't remember where they were when they learned when the JFK had been shot. <laughs> That's an odd one. I have another little piece of trivia for you. Uh, Lyndon Johnson found out that Kennedy was going to dump him in the second term uh, because uh, one of his uh, office staffers had a roommate who was very tight with the Kennedys. And uh, the, the Kennedys had mentioned to, to this woman... Uh, that uh, Kennedy was going to dump Lyndon. Uh, she told her roommate. The roommate told Lyndon Johnson. The uh, Kennedy girl roommate was Mary Jo Kopechny. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Lyndon forced himself on the ticket in Los Angeles uh, after JFK had already extended the invitation to be his running mate to Stuart Symington of Missouri and gave him the night to think it over. Bobby went by the Johnson sweet and made a pro forma offer was astonished when Lyndon jumped on it using information provided by J. Edgar Hoover. He threatened to expose that Jacket had dalliances with uh, at least one beautiful woman who turned out to be an East German spy that he was suffering from Addison's disease 
and therefore was not expected to live a long, healthy life. Plus, he added that if he were not on the ticket, then as majority leader on the Senate, any legislative proposal set down by the White House would be dead on arrival. Uh, Bobby and Jack wrestled with it, but they couldn't figure any way out, and he had to rescind his invitation to Stuart Simon, and the only time in his political history anything like that had ever occurred. But Lyndon and his allies were already planning that Lyndon would accede to the highest office by taking JFK out. Yeah, that's uh, it, it, politics is a dirty business, and the higher you go, the dirtier it gets. You're absolutely right, and you know it's fascinating because James Norvell was the uh, attorney for Billy Saul Estes, a Texas Wheeler dealer who con- committed a lot of scams, made a lot of money for Lyndon John Connolly and their cronies, and where uh, Billy Saul told William Raymond, a French investigative. Uh, uh, journalist, how Lyndon had sent Cliff Carter, his chief administrative assistant, down to Dallas to make sure all the arrangements were in place for the assassination, I was, uh, which uh, he knew because he, he knew Cliff Carter and and uh, Malcolm Mac Wallace personally, where Mac was Lyndon's personal hitman. He killed about a dozen people for Lyndon, including one of his own sisters. And appears to have been involved as a shooter, even uh, as a, an organizer of the assassination. But the primary role for that appears to have fallen to uh, Edward Lansdale, who was an Air Force general who organized assassinations all over the world, especially in Vietnam. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting because there's a link from that to the uh, Watergate scandal. And uh, a lot of people were asking, why was Nixon even bothering going into the Democratic headquarters at the Watergate when his reelection was a study in foregone conclusions? But it turns out the Democrats had gotten hold of some very clear photos of those three mystery tramps in that were arrested and then let go in Dealey Plaza, uh, identifying two of them as Frank Sturgis and... uh, uh, oh, God, I'm blanking on the other name. Uh, the, the guy who eventually led the burglary uh, at the Watergate. Well, you're thinking E. Howard Hunt, that, but actually, Mike, that's a misidentification. Um, the celebrated forensic uh, artist for the Houston Police Department identified them respectively as Charles Rogers. He's the shortest, well-dressed. Charles Harrelson, the father of the actor Woody Harrelson, and the third, whose identity has been most disputed, Chauncey Marvin Holt, whom I got to know personally, Chauncey had a long history with organized crime in the CIA. He was a contract Mm. agent for the agency working at the Los Angeles Stamp and Stationery Store. When his uh, handler, Philip Twombly, directed him to prepare 15 sets of forged Secret Service credentials for use in and around Dealey Plaza, he was worried about getting the color-coded pins, which changed from day to day, but he got them in time. He was directed to leave them in a red pickup truck behind the grassy knoll. That's a parking area used by the Dallas police when he first got there. It wasn't present. So he wandered around Dealey Plaza. He told me he saw more bad guys, assassins, and mercenaries than you'd find at a Soldiers of Fortune convention. <laughs> when, when he returned, he found the pickup truck was there. He left it there, and with the other two, went down to a boxcar. About this time was when the shooting was taking place. They were told it would appear to be locked, but it, it, it would be unlocked. When they climbed in, they found it was loaded with ammunition, explosives, and weapons. Uh, he, they started to pull out, but the railroad manager thought something was a, a kid, uh, out of kilter and pulled him back, and the police arrested him, marched him through Dealey Plaza. I'm convinced if Lee Oswald hadn't worked out as the patsy that they were going to be the fallback, uh, the three of them, and with all those weapons and explosives in the railway car, it would have been very easy to make the case. Well, what's interesting about E. Howard Hunt is that he was there in Dealey Plaza, and he gave his son St. John... Uh, a, a recollection, you know, a kind of final confession published in Rolling Stone about the chain of command that went from Lyndon Johnson to Cord Meyer to David Attlee Phillips to William Harvey to David Sanchez Morales. And what, what uh, James Norbell has done is to reconstruct the assassination not only of, of JFK but of uh, MLK and of RFK as well. And it's got the same principal players where Lyndon and J. Edgar were both involved. I think Lyndon's antipathy was so great that he was the primary player in taking out Bobby, but Edgar didn't like him either. And in the case of uh, of, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, J. Edgar simply despised him. He would make uh, sex tapes of Martin having, uh, you know, intercourse with women other than his wife and sent him to Coretta as a form of harassment. In fact, he was staying at a hotel that was rather secure in, in downtown Memphis when 
they receive phone calls saying, uh, you know, what kind of uh, hypocrisy is this? You're not staying in a black motel. This moved them to the Lorraine, which was much less safe. And from yeah, where, you know, we we easy have to take a- we have to take a break. I'm sorry, I have to keep cutting you off. We got to do some commercials. Stay on the line, though. I want to take you into the next segment. And Aloha, America. Welcome back to the show. We're talking with James Fetzer about the John F. Kennedy assassination, the Robert Kennedy assassination, and Martin Luther King. Uh, now, uh, what's interesting to note, you're talking about how King was pressured to move to the Lorraine Motel. Uh, uh, Dr. King uh, didn't like upper floor rooms. He preferred being on the ground level. And one of the uh, mysteries about that whole assassination is somebody... Uh, changed the room. He originally was booked into a ground-level, street-facing room, and he was moved up to that second-floor room overlooking the swimming pool. Now, at my website, uh, we got a wide-area photo of that whole area, uh, and we compared it with the photograph, that famous photograph of, of Dr. King lying there shot and all the guys pointing their finger where the shot came from, which we've all been told they're pointing at the rooming house where James Earl Ray was. When we had the wide-area view and we checked it out, out, we found out they weren't pointing anywhere near that rooming house. They were actually pointing to the roof of the, of the building down the street from that. So that whole situation was an absolute fraud and fake as well. Um, I have family that live on Martha's Vineyard and have been there for quite a long time. And uh, they shared an interesting story with me about the night that uh, Bobby Kennedy ran off the road with Mary Jo Kopechny in the back seat. And Teddy, Teddy. I'm sorry, Teddy, 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 Teddy Kennedy. Yes, you're right. Uh, and they saw him being chased by another car. Uh, and it sort of runs the idea that maybe there was an assassination attempt on the third brother, but after the accident and uh, being able to use Mary Jo Kopechny uh, to wreck his presidential a- ambitions, they figured that was enough, and, and, and they, they let him live. I, I think that's very plausible. You know, character assassination can be enough. And, you know, the, I mean, we have a group called the Dead Kennedys, right? How many do we need? I mean, to make the point, it's unreal. The, the assassination of Bobby was clearly a CIA operation. In fact, uh, a, a, hip, a fellow who was a hypnotist uh, had, had, has admitted hypnotizing Surhan for the CIA. Uh, there were three agents who have been identified present there, George Joannides, who was in charge of PSYOPs, and where the CIA has kept his records from a release, even when requested by the Assassination Records Review Board, created by an act of Congress in the wake of the resurgence of interest generated by Oliver Stone's film JFK. They still haven't done it in defiance of the law. A fellow named Gordon Campbell and, and David Sanchez Morales may be the most noted assassin of them all, who were present in the uh, Ambassador Hotel, have been identified by several persons. Shane O'Sullivan has discussed it in his his film about uh, Bobby's death. But it's obvious that Sirhan didn't do it. He was a distraction. He, he unloaded his weapon, which held uh, like eight shots, but in front of Bobby, who was shot four times from behind, the fatal shot entered his ear, behind his right ear from about an inch and a half. Uh, it couldn't possibly have done by Sirhan, but he did serve his role very well. Well, there were, there were 15 different bullet holes in the walls of that, that pantry. And, uh, of course, the LAPD took it all and then basically threw it all away, saying they didn't have room to store it, to, to get rid of that yeah. evidence. And, of course... Would you believe, Mike, they said they didn't have room to, to, to store it in a 3 by 5 file card file. I mean, it's absurd the way the LAPD handled this. Oh, well, well I'll, I'll give you one more. There was a young student photographer there who got pictures inside the pantry, and the police confiscated them uh, and uh, uh, held them, wouldn't release them, and the kid who grew up, he's now a, 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 he works in the film industry now, I'm blanking on his name, he sued the LAPD for the return of his negatives, because they are obviously worth money, recording a historical event. The LAPD said they'd lost them. Then all of a sudden, somebody up in Sacramento says, no, we have them here. And uh, we'll be able to avoid this multi-million dollar court settlement by returning the negatives to this kid. So they get a courier, put him on a plane. He flies to the Los Angeles International Airport. He's driving out of the airport, and his rental car suddenly gets a flat tire. He goes to a gas station to get the tire repaired, goes to the restroom, leaving the car completely unlocked and the briefcase with the pictures on the seat. So obviously when he gets back, the briefcase and the pictures are gone. Oh, gee, we really tried to get those pictures back to you. And right. You're absolutely right, Mike. Yeah. 
It, it, it's I mean, it's, a, a it's disgraceful. Get this. Thomas Noguchi, a world-famous medical examiner, did the autopsy on Bobby. He has a very thorough autopsy report showing the four shots, four hits on Bobby from behind, including the fatal shot. When it conflicted with the LAPD report, however, Noguchi was fired when it should have been the police department that was held at fault. I mean, the most basic evidence in a crime like this is the autopsy report, especially when it got, it's done by a guy of the qualifications of Noguchi. Uh, yeah, it, it, it was pretty obvious. I remember, um, uh, Daryl Gates was the, uh, uh, uh police chief, uh, at the time. And of course, when he retired, he got all this funding for his drug avoidance resistance education, which is hugely expensive and completely ineffective. So it, it is, it, it was corrupt. And of course, today, in the aftermath of lies about Saddam's weapons of mass destruction, the American people are far more skeptical and far less trusting of the official story. Uh, and I think that works to the advantage of the American people. In fact, we're seeing indications all over the place that the U.S. government is finally waking up and realizing the days when they could pull this kind of a hoax or tell this kind of a lie with impunity are very much gone, and they're not coming back anytime soon. We had Senator Chuck Schumer get up uh, in Congress and literally say that Congress needs to pass a law changing the First Amendment so that the right to freedom of speech is only applicable to the controlled corporate media. And, of course, Congress can't change the First Amendment. That takes three quarters of the states to ratify. But we're, we're seeing the stuff. There was a, a, a journalist in the New York Times saying that ultimately the government should have the final say about publishing any government documents in the corporate media. So they're just trying to build this case that really you're just going to have to trust the government. We know what's best for you. And of course, we know quite the contrary. Yeah. One of the great virtues of uh, James Norvell's book, by the way, Mike, uh, I began to explain, is that he locates shooters at six different positions in Dealey Plaza. JFK was hit in the back about five and a half inches below the collar to the right of the spinal column by a shot fired from the top of the county records building. Mm -hmm. He was hit in the throat by a shot that actually passed through the windshield fired from the south end of the triple underpass. He was hit, uh, three shots fired from the Daltex. One hit him in the back of the head, another missed and hit the curb and injured the distant bystander. Standard James Tag, the third missed and hit a chrome strip above the presidential windshield. Shots were fired from the from the book depository at uh, John Connolly in the mistaken belief that it was Ralph Yarborough whom Lyndon tried to get into the car and Connolly out. The shot that hit JFK in the right temple was fired by the north end of the triple underpass. A frangible or exploding bullet set up shock waves that blew his brains out the back of his already weakened cranium to the left rear with such force that when they impacted with motorcycle patrolman Bobby Hargis riding there, I initially thought he himself had been shot. The easiest shot was from the from the grassy knoll, but it was pulled. You know, the gunman realized he was going to hit Jackie. They were under strict instructions that she should not be harmed, so he pulled his shot and it wound up in the grass opposite the grassy knoll. Yeah, uh, and, and again, going back to the House Select Committee on Assassinations, uh, they had a police dictapelt. Somebody had left their microphone keyed open and recorded the shots. Uh, I think there was something like 15 impulses on that tape, and uh, citing budget restrictions, they only studied uh, six or seven of them. But those six or seven, uh, uh, again, they, they showed shots were originating all over Dealey Plaza, including the grassy knoll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 uh, chaired a session down in Dallas by a fellow named Thomas, who's a leading expert on all of this, and confirmed with him what I believe to be the case when they did their array of microphones. They were only testing from two locations, roughly the book depository and the grassy knoll. And I asked him, I said, were they, uh, were they set up in such a way as to discriminate between shots fired from the Dow Tax, for example, in the sixth floor? And he conceded, no, they were not. And in fact, I agree with you. There are indications of as many as eight, nine, or ten shots on that dictapelt. But the HSCA seems to have been playing a role to redo the cover-up in a way that was, you know, more efficient than before. Let me give you an illustration. We had a Parkland physician after physician reporting this massive, you know, fist-sized blowout at the back of the head. Even Clint Hill, who rushed up to push Jackie back down, lay across their bodies and then saw, and he described this fist-sized hole in the back of the head, at which point he gave a thumbs down to his colleagues. You know, we have about 
about uh, 40 uh, reports about this fist-sized hole, including physician after physician at Parkland. It, it Bethesda, however, and this is going to dumbfound you, Mike, because it's not generally known, Commander James Humes, who was in charge of the autopsy, actually took a cranial saw and enlarged the wound, so it was virtually the whole back half of his head, in order to make it look more like something that could have been caused by a shot fired from the rear. Uh, ironically, the mortician, Thomas Evan Robinson, was there and witnessed him doing this. So when the ARRB came to depose him and showed him a diagram with dotted lines here, he said, oh, no, the doctors did that because he'd actually witnessed it, as did another a fellow named Ed Reed, who was a technician for Bethesda Hospital. But the HSC contracted that massive blowout. I mean, it's even described in the autopsy report itself, which I published in Assassination Science 1998, the first of my three okay. collections of after studies on this, Mike. Jane, Jane, to- Jane, I'm, we, we got to take one more commercial break. We'll be back with the last segment of our show after these few words. Aloha, America. Welcome back to the show here. We're talking with James Fetzer, and this is our last segment of the show. So before we run out of time, James, is there a website you would like our listeners to visit you at and read what you're writing about? Everyone to know that the the book, uh, Treason, Treachery, and Deceit by James Norvell on the murderers of JFK, MLK, RFK, has been widely acclaimed and endorsed, including by military writers. Brigadier General John H. Grubbs, retired Ph.D., refers to it as a spellbinding masterpiece. Doug Horn, former chief analyst for military records for the Assassination Records Review Board, who discovered that increase in the size of the wound of the cranium done by James Humes, at Bethesda writes, Mr. Norvell does not pull any punches and does not sugarcate the assassination in any way. Mark McClellan, author of Blood, Money, Power, a former law partner of LBJ attorney Ed Clark, who was deeply involved in planning the assassination, praises Norvell, quote, for bringing us near to the solution of the most horrific crime in American history, for horrific for what it did to one man and his family, horrific for what it did to America, and horrific for the failure of the authorities to mete out justice. The book, by the way, my can be obtained through Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble eBooks, and Nook Books, among others. Okay, and uh, the title one more time for those people just getting their pencils? The, the title is Treason, Treachery, and Deceit, The Murderers of JFK, MLK, and RFK. Well, it certainly was a time where there was a lot of wet work going on, and how we prevent a repeat of that, of course, is with the American people more aware, uh, more skeptical, more doubting of the official story. Back when uh, John F. Kennedy was killed, we were still in the height of the Cold War. Uh, the government was keeping us afraid uh, by wagging commies at us. And the American people just really didn't comprehend the possibility that the government could be lying to them about so many things. Today, it's very, very different. We're a sadder but wiser population. Well, you're so right, Mike. I mean, they've been lying to us not only about JFK for 50 years now, I mean, it's completely outrageous, but about the events of 9-11, about the plane crash took up the life of Senator Paul Wellstone, even about Sandy Hook and the Boston bombing. There's a mountain of evidence that those were fabricated events intended to convince the American people that their Americans owning guns were a threat to the to society. It's all fabricated. It's all, all outrageous, and we have a mountain of proof about it. Well, you know, and again, it's business as usual for this government. We've talked a lot on our show about the Lusitania, uh, the sinking of which got Americans all riled up to go to World War I, and it turned out it was carrying war material from the yeah. supposedly neutral U.S. to Britain. Uh, we know that now that there really were no torpedoes in the Gulf of Tonkin, uh, chasing the USS Maddox. Uh, there was no Spanish mine in Havana Harbor. Uh, the, the government habitually will use lies, fraud, and deception to trick Americans into doing what the government wants. And, of course, the one that's really obvious these days is they're still pushing human-caused global warming despite seven record-setting winters in a row because Obama is desperate for that carbon tax to cover the shortfall from the collapse of Obamacare. And it's just how they do it. And I just reprised a video to uh, my website, that little video clip of Obama getting up there and having the nerve to say, you know, if you don't trust the government, we're going to have a problem. Well, we don't. <laughs> We don't trust the government, and if the government has this major credibility crisis, they did it to themselves. It's not our fault for daring to question and refuse to believe. The government's destroyed its own credibility. Uh, 6% unemployment. We know the real jobless rate is closer to 60%. 
and and on and on and on. I've lost count of all the government lies. Vince I Foster. know, you're absolutely right. In, in foreign policy as well as domestic. I mean, it was the rebels who used the chemical gas in Syria. It wasn't the, the Assad government. The Western powers pumped $5 billion into Ukraine to create unrest and then smuggled in Russian weapons so they could fire on their own people and blame it on the Russians. It's, it goes on and on. I mean, Iraq didn't have weapons of mass destruction. Iran isn't even developing a nuclear bomb, Mike. Our own intel agencies in 2017, all, uh, 2017, Seven, all 16 converged in the conclusion Iran was not developing a nuclear weapon, which it reaffirmed in 2011. What's American foreign policy going to be based on the best intelligence of what actually is going on in the world? Well, it's not. It's based on the need by the uh, financial system to force the world back to Bretton Woods and the petrodollar. And that's the motive behind all of these wars. Uh, it's, it's the reason we went into uh, Iraq, because Saddam was selling uh, Iraq's oil for the euro. Gaddafi wanted to sell uh, Libya's oil for the gold dinar. Uh, Iran wants to sell Iran's oil uh, for whatever currency they want. Uh, today, the House of Representatives just uh, uh, slapped some new sanctions on Venezuela for daring to sell their oil for the yuan. And that's what this entire foreign policy is driven by, is maintaining the dollar's position as the global trade and reserve currency so that Wall Street and the Federal Reserve get their mafia-like piece of the action over global commerce. You're absolutely right. It's when uh, Gaddafi goes off of the petrodollar, introduces the gold dinar, when Saddam Hussein abandons the petrodollar, when Iran opens an oil bourse and begins trading in multiple currencies, all those countries come into the sights of the United States and NATO. You're completely right about this, Mike. It's embarrassing, but it's true. The American people have to understand how much they're being manipulated by the government for the benefit of big business and the bankers. Uh, it really is. Now, of course, uh, right now, though, the good news is countries are dropping the dollar faster than the U.S. can invade them. There are now 80 nations aligned with the BRICS movement. If they were all to drop the dollar on the same day, the party would definitely be over. I think that's going to happen, Mike. And, you know, I expect there to be a major defensive alliance between Russia, China, and Iran that is going to succeed, you know, the supremacy of the United States and world affairs. We're a dying empire. We have 700 bases all over the world. Obama himself launched 17 invasions into African countries alone. I mean, the situation is absurd. And anyone thinks that Obama stands for peace and justice or truth just doesn't understand what's going on. Oh, that Nobel Peace Prize was, was such an insult to those who won it while deserving it. And uh, at this point, I don't think anybody wants to get one again after Obama got He hadn't even done anything except show up for his swearing in, and all of a sudden, oh, we've got to give him the Nobel Peace Prize. You know, they ought to take it back. If they had any shred of dignity and integrity, uh, the Nobel Committee would demand the return of the prize. I think you're right. It's like I want my money back. I gave the guy... Uh hundred dollars five different times when he was originally a candidate, Mike, and it wasn't the same hundred dollars. I want a refund. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, uh, again, uh, at this point, I think pretty much everybody realizes that all these politicians are liars. It's how they control and rule us, and they've been doing it for so long, they don't actually know how to run a country any other way. And that's why, you know, if at first you don't succeed, lie, lie, again, seems to be the policy they're following. And every time they come out with another whopper, it's just one, one more nail in the credibility uh, of this government. I personally think the system is tearing itself apart. We're just waiting for that final big crack that causes all the little cracks to join up and blow the top of the cabin off on this whole mess. Well, let me just say on behalf of James Norvell, who died shortly after he spoke at a memorial service for Lee Oswald held on the 24th, uh, of November last, how much he and his widow and all of us who support his work uh, appreciate your featuring me to discuss his book. Uh, again, Mike, for the benefit of the audience, Treason, Treachery, and Deceit, The Murderers of JFK, MLK, and RFK by James D. Norvell, N-O-R-V-E-L-L, -L, may be ordered through Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, eBooks, and Nook Books, among others. Well, I can guarantee you I'm certainly going to be ordering my copy today. Day. Well, that's terrific, Mike, and I'm really grateful to you for featuring me to discuss it. It would have been great if James could be here, but, you know, he was a disabled vet. He was a magnificent human being, and his heart gave out on December 6th. Ironically, that just happens to be my own birthday. Oh, boy, that's a, that's a heck of a thing to have to remember the calendar date by. 
And, uh, you know, we, we, we do have things like that. My youngest brother passed away on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And th- these linkages just seem to happen there. All right, well, uh, James, it's been a joy. I'm already getting email from people saying that you've been an absolutely great guest. And I think uh, very obviously we're going to want to have you come back and talk about uh, other issues uh, on the show sometime in the future if you're available. That would be terrific, Mike. I'd love to do it, and I greatly appreciate what you're doing. You're making a lot of contributions, important contributions, to inform the American public about what's really going on with this once great United States of America. All right, well, thank you. we got to let you go. The music is playing. It's time for me to shut down the microphone and go get some errands done this afternoon. We will be back tomorrow, Friday, on the Republic Broadcasting Network. Until then, stay safe, stay informed, stay angry, stay skeptical, make good choices. Please share what you know with everyone you know. It is time for every American to stand up in anger and say, this has gone on long enough. We'll be back tomorrow. Aloha, America.